This is Street Fighter Alpha 3. Here comes a new challenger. That's enough. Unbeatable. This is the Alpha Lift Street Fighter Alpha 3 podcast with your hosts, Fet Quest and Luke and It's showtime. Hello and welcome to the fifth episode of the Street Fighter Alpha Libs podcast. I'm Luke and I'm joined as always by my co-host Quest. And today it is an honor and privilege to welcome one of the leading Super Turbo players in the world. This man is a bit of a hero on and off the um, arcade machine. Within the game, he's played at a high level against most of the best players in the world. Outside the game, he's been a pillar of the ST Revival community and in many ways is responsible for keeping Super Turbo alive and well all the way to 2020. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest for this episode, all the way from the USA, L Trouble. And I'll hand over to Quest to kick off the interview. Thanks, Luke. And welcome to the podcast, L Trouble. How are you today? I'm great, man. Happy to be here. Thanks for the invite, guys. Uh, you guys are definitely gassing me up a little more than I deserve. But... <laughs> I know. It's all, 100% deserve. We hear that from every guest. But, um, it's our job. So... Um... <laughs> So the name L Trouble, why did you choose the name L Trouble? Okay, so first off, I hate the name L Trouble. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really stupid handle that I made up when I was like 12 or something like yeah. that. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll, I won't be too long-winded because I usually am. But anyways, back then, um, it was like my first time playing online video games against other players. Yeah. And that was with uh, Half-Life 1 way back in 98, 99, huh. whatever that was. Yeah. And like I went through several different like made-up names, as you do. Um, but basically, I got the nickname uh, Troublemaker, just because I was really lucky at playing certain card games. Just, <laughs> but just the way it is. And then E-L... In real life. Lucky playing yeah. card games in real life. Yeah, yeah, in real life. And then... Yeah. Um, E-L is my, my real name initials, my full name initials. Ah, so I yeah. thought, you know, as a 12-year-old, as a I thought, wow, I'll be really clever and call myself L Trouble. So it's kind of like mm-hmm. my name's in there, my nickname is in there, and it's kind of like the trouble in really bad Spanish, Spanglish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that just kind of stuck, and, like, I haven't been able to come up with a better name since, so it just kind of stuck, and now it's my handle. <laughs> yeah. With um, yeah. Super Turbo... The first game that you played competitively, in terms of Street Fighter games. Uh, yeah, first game I'd say I, I played like tournaments and whatnot. Um, but definitely not the first game I played like very seriously and hardcore and intensely. Um, that'd probably be more Half Life One, the original Counter Strike, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, pretty much yeah. took up the majority of my teenage years. <laughs> Yeah, playing those FPS games, but yeah, definitely Super Turbo was my first game where I kind of took it seriously and wanted to break it down and get better and join tournaments and make a name for myself and all that kind of stuff. Any chance nice. to make a comeback to the first-person shooter tournament scene? Out of the uh, I I'm, I'm getting old, man. <laughs> it's getting harder and harder. Like I don't feel like uh like the reflexes are that much that much worse than it used to be, mm-hmm. but definitely like the time commitment and the interest. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, like, I'm sure many people can relate, like, once you get older, like, other priorities take over, like, a full-time job, family, whatever, whatever, so, I think at this point, I still play games for fun, primarily, but, like, tournaments are a way for me to meet new people, travel, so, like, I have more fun, if that makes mm-hmm. sense, so, yeah. yeah, that's where I'm at right now. <laughs> yeah, cool. yeah, that makes sense. Um, how long have you been playing Super Turbo competitively for? So competitively, I will count it for my first like actual tournament, and it was uh, I think the end of 2011. So oh, wow. I'm fairly new school as far as yeah. FGC has go. Yeah, people tend to think I'm like super old school just because I play Street Fighter 2, mm-hmm. and uh, I do have some experience like you know playing Street Fighter 2 when it first came out in the arcade, and I played a lot on the SNES version, which is a really mm-hmm. good version. Um, but yeah, competitively since 2011, thereabouts. What was yeah. that first tournament experience like? Like, I, was it kind of in that, um, you know, Wednesday Night Fights kind of scene with all those, like, legendary players? Like, what, what, you know, was it the normal kind of first tournament experience of just getting smashed by everyone? Yeah, you, you pretty much hit it uh, dead on. Uh, my first tournament was uh, during Wednesday Night Fights, 
when they were happening at Super Arcade. So Wednesday Night Fights had already been happening for a while, but um, they had just moved to Super Arcade because Mike Watson took over the arcade and was managing that. And so they had a kind of a partnership between Level Up Live, who runs Wednesday Night Fights, and the uh, Super Arcade owner. And yeah, back then they had Wednesday Night Fights, and we actually went there for a Street Fighter 4 tournament. And it just mm-hmm. so happens that um, the local TO there, his name is Muffin Man. He's been around yeah. SoCal scene for a long time. He started doing these like uh, two dollar tournaments. You pay two dollars, you get put in a double limb bracket for Super Turbo. You know, kind of like a fun thing you can do while waiting for your other matches. And yeah, that's how kind of how I got hooked into it. And I remember my first tournament, I was feeling myself because like I was okay at the game. I wasn't horrible, but I wasn't gonna take out serious players. Yeah. yeah. So I won my first two matches pretty convincingly. Okay, wow. whatever, whatever. And yeah. then my third match, Muffin Man's like, okay, your next opponent is DGV. <laughs> and I'm like, are you serious? Yeah. Like, this guy is a known legend in the community. He's been playing for over a decade. Multiple, you know, top eight finishes at Evo. Yeah, that killer on fight eight as well. <laughs> yeah, man. He's a really good player with a well-deserved reputation. And I got smashed, but yeah, man, that's how it was. Were you playing Dowson, man, even in the early days? Or, or Guile? Was, I think I've heard some of that Guile was your original character. Yeah, so when I, when I first played like the original Street Fighter 2, it was always a Ryu and Guile. That was kind of my yep. go-to. I think I think everyone back then had a Ryu and or a Guile. And uh, when you play Ryu and Guile in Super Turbo, it's it's very, very similar to how they used to be in like the CPS1 versions. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so yeah, I played I played Ryu in the early days. And then eventually I changed to Old Guile because Mike Watson like kind of inspired me to pick up Old Guile. Yeah. And then I went to Dalsam after that. So yeah, yeah. Ryu first. Um, there aren't many, um, like, we know you as a Dalesome player. There aren't many Dalesome players, though, in America. Why do you think that is? I think part of it is that even though Dalesome is definitely, like, a top two, top three character, he's very strong in the game. But I feel like um, he's very difficult to learn, especially if like, you're, like, a newcomer to Super Turbo or a newcomer to fighting games in general. I feel like the uh, the amount of knowledge you need just to play Dalsum, even at a basic level, is extremely high. So you got to put a lot of study a lot of practice into that character be- before he becomes like a top tier character you know so i think uh that that level of work is like daunting to a lot of people so it just feels easier just to go to like a, a ryu a chun a honda an old saget you know an easier character to learn that you can get immediate results with as opposed to dalsam who you know if you if you play him for a year you're probably going to lose in every single tournament you go to you know zero and two one and two whatever until yeah so if I, it like finally starts clicking and like all your knowledge and practice and reflexes kind of come together and then you become very very strong but yeah, yeah. i think that initial hurdle is a, is a big uh you know obstacle for a lot of players where do you think you're at with your dalsim knowledge like i've heard people describe it as like you never feel like you're um you're fully kind of at the point where you want to be like do you think there's still things that that you're improving on in your game or still new like tech that you're uncovering or are you pretty much like solid in your knowledge and it's just like you know matchups or like playing against specific people now that you're working on so i feel like in terms of knowledge you know i i think i'm pretty complete there's not too many situations where i'm completely caught off guard yeah um, when even like when weird things happen and scrambles happen i kind of suss out why it happened and like not to be too worried about it but for me it's definitely um getting my reflexes down getting my muscle memory um i have horrendous execution even with dalsam who's like not a very combo heavy character but like i'll mess up things all the time and it's very frustrating to the point where like it's kind of become a meme where yeah. Yeah. <laughs> whenever I play in tournaments, the commentators will call out, oh, yeah, he, he pulled the L trouble. He missed a short slice super. <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> Pretty standard. Um, so I don't feel like my knowledge is lacking, but where I'm definitely lacking is like the amount of time that I actually practice and play mm-hmm. different players, especially high level players. Um, so there's that aspect to it. And yeah, I, I've never felt like I was comfortable in the game. I always feel like um, there's so much more for me to, to work on, to practice, to improve mm-hmm. upon. And I feel like that's kind of the same with every SD player. Even the very best ones, they don't. I don't feel like they're like super confident. They just play their best and hope for the best. But ultimately, no one's ever perfect. You just kind of like chase yeah. perfection. Do you think that? Do you think that problem is particular for Dalson more so than than other characters? Even though it's it's true for other characters, because um, there's so much to Dalson to learn. 
Yeah, I think that's part of it. Um, yeah, certainly every player, every character has their you know, pros and cons, ups and downs. But I feel like with Dalsum, there's like almost no excuse because your character is so strong. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of like with Dalsum, if you play perfectly, you should win every matchup. Every single matchup, even even the bad matchups or, you know, close to even matchups. Does he beat Claw as well? Yeah, like, even though Claw is probably his only bad matchup, it's still very, very winnable. It's just, it's, it's a matchup that I would consider unstable. Yeah. Like, uh, there's some matchups in the game that are, like, 6-4 and 7-3 that are very stable. Like, the entire time you are grinding to get a win. But I feel like with Dalsum, it feels like 7-3 only, like, when you can't, like, lock him down the mix-ups. But once you start landing mix-ups, then all of a sudden it becomes, like, a 7-3 match in your favor. And you can kill Claw off a single mix-up. So it's kind of oh. like chasing that high kind of situation. <laughs> yeah. Play flawless. Yeah. Yeah, I get what you mean. Um, I haven't seen Wednesday night fights in a while. Why did you stop it? And are there any plans to resume it? Okay, so originally... Um, we ran Wednesday Night Fights for probably a good year, year and a half, two years, and it was fun, and we got a lot of players coming out, a lot of new players, a lot of old players, and it was great. But the only problem is that um, usually Wednesday Night Fights run super late into the night. We're talking like well into the, the early morning hours, like 2 o'clock, yeah. 3 o'clock, sometimes 4 o'clock on a rare occasion. Wow. Yeah, and so you can imagine what kind of uh, hell that can wreak on your personal life. Yeah, yeah. on <laughs> that FGC the... time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was it was really hurting our performance uh, Thursday through Friday <laughs> in terms of work and family and social activities. So we collectively all just felt like we should just take a break and uh, maybe come back at a different time. And uh, to answer the second part of that question, we were thinking about bringing Wednesday Night Fights back at least uh, on a monthly basis. And then um, that was probably a few months ago. And then this coronavirus stuff started hitting. So it pretty much shut down all our plans for the foreseeable, p foreseeable future. So in a post-corona world, there is hope that you'll bring back Wednesday night fights? Oh, most definitely. I think if anything, there's a there'll be a, a higher demand for more FGC events and weeklies after the coronavirus world. Yeah. Because I, I feel like a lot of us are kind of cooped up and trapped and we're... We're all just like gearing to ready to go out, have fun, and meet up with people again. So, um, yeah, I guess that's one silver lining to the coronavirus situation is I think uh, FCC turnout at locals and majors is going to be a lot higher because we're all just dying to get out and be social again and meet other people. Um, in your time as a player, what was your biggest win, whether it be a tournament or like a rival that you struggled against? Um, biggest win... Well, I'll, I'll give you two answers because I like cheating that way. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I'm a Dalsum player. I, I like I like all of the above kind of situation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, my first big win was probably the team tournament at Evo 2013, I think. That was the year we held ST games, and uh, it was the it was a Evo tournament where we held four Super Turbo tournaments. It was a, a singles, a ratio, a team tournament, and um, I forget the last one. I think it's just like a regular tournament. And uh, yeah, it we, it was a three on three team tournament, and uh, me and my team were doing pretty well, and we got faced uh, matched up against DGV's team. And as it just happens, you know, DGV has been beating my butt all all year long. <laughs> Yep. It's super turbo. Dolls or not, he would just always beat me. And then, so it came down to uh, me versus him. We were both anchors on our team, so whoever won that game won. It was it was mm -hmm. a best of one game. And then uh, we were doing pretty well. You know, I won a round, he won a round, but it was very very close. It was like mere pixels away from from beating each other. Mm -hmm. And then the last exchange, uh, he had a super, and I was dolls him kind of far away. And we were both like pump faking, trying to like get each other to commit to something because yeah. we were playing super cautious because we both realized like hey whoever lands a hit is gonna win <laughs> yeah so we were both pump faking whatever 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 and he was trying to reaction super because he's dgv and he's insane like that and so i threw out like a like a far crouch medium punch the one that kind of goes halfway across the screen mm -hmm. and somehow he reacts to it and does a super but he does it kind of late yep. so that i recover my my medium punch and i do jump back light kick drill i hit him right in the face and i win yeah good bait and, good bait 100 percent planned out yeah but like i was like so shocked that that kind of worked out it doesn't usually work out that way but it just so happened yeah. the, the frame data and such worked out so yeah, yeah when i beat him i popped off so hard <laughs> i have no yeah. idea me Who and muffin man were celebrating oh it was a uh, me muffin man 
and uh, Hypenated, who was an online okay. uh, Phalon player. It was his first yep. event, so we were like, you know what, let's just have fun, let's team up. Yeah. Me and Muff Man were already good friends at that point, so we were going to team up anyways, and then we just threw him in. But yeah, my yeah, whole yeah. team celebrated, and DGV was kind of dejected. But you know, I gave him a <laughs> high five and a hug, because that was the first time I've ever, ever beat him in a game. So wow. it was a good moment yeah. for me. Um, so that's the first moment. The second one was definitely winning Combo Breaker 2018. Mm-hmm. I think uh, that was my first big tournament win. So that, that that entire journey from start to finish was very enjoyable for me. Wu Chun Li, where do you rank her in the tier list? Is she top tier or just below it? God, I hate her. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of hate for Chun Li. Some some deserve, some not. Um, but in all honesty, I feel like she's she's a strong character, and I probably put her mm, like top five for sure. Guaranteed top five. Some would say top three, top four. Um, so it's debatable, but definitely a top five character. She's very very strong in the right hands and even her bad matchups are not usually too horrible they're all very winnable and she definitely has a very strong track record of winning there's a bunch of players all over the world in france and america and japan who have been winning with that character but i feel like that's more of a player thing more so than a character so yeah i think she's strong and she's really annoying we all hate her but i don't think she's like up there with a uh, claw and dalson so what well, just on that like i feel like one of the most interesting thing that's happened in super turbo in the last kind of five or ten years is the rise of certain characters up the tier list like especially in some of the japanese tournaments like you know there was the ohawk stuff with the um you know the weird setups like that that kind of got you those like infinite loops throws in the corner and then like recently all the fei long stuff i feel like he's been um kind of rising up the tier list as well like what what do you think the next big thing in super turbo is in terms of a character that's maybe a bit underappreciated like you know really being able to fight some of the higher higher tier characters that's a good that's a good question and it's really hard to answer because i feel like in super turbo it it feels very limiting compared to what you can do in a lot of other games Mm -hmm. like you know with the alpha with the alpha series a lot of potential with custom combos and cvs2 there's roll cancels and k group setups and whatnot Mm -hmm. i feel like st is pretty limited in mechanics so it feels like at times there's not much more to discover and then, like you say, like a Fei Long player will just put in a bunch of work, and all of a sudden he's rising up the tier lists. And um, yeah, it's pretty incredible to see that such a simple game can have so so much change throughout yeah. the, the many decades it's been around. Um, but I feel like at this point, I don't know. I don't know who else there is to to learn. Maybe like I don't know. It's hard to tell. Maybe like a dictator, dictator mm-hmm. or a Ken, because they're kind of mid tier right now, and there's yeah. maybe some more potential there. But I feel like at this point, the game is pretty much figured out in terms of the general tier list of where everyone belongs. No hope for uh, a Blanka. No hope for some UK, <laughs> some, some like crazy infinite with Blanka or something. That's He's um, a I'm main, like, I, yeah. I don't. Oh yeah, like I don't know. I feel like with Blanka, there there hasn't been so much like advancement with like tech. No. with Blanca, but it's been like more like the players have gotten really, really good and incredible. So I feel like a lot of his tools have stayed the same. It's just players are using them in much more efficient, consistent fashion. Mm-hmm. So with guys yeah. like uh, Fromo or Komoda, oh, I feel like Komoda. Tech what wasn't their... I know, he's in, he's insane, but again, when you watch him, like nothing he does is terribly complicated that you that the average Blanca player yeah. can't do. He just knows how and when to do it, along with having insane fundamentals. So I feel like with Blanca, there's not much more tech to explore. It's just like improving yourself as a player, like learning mm-hmm. footsies, having insane reactions, smart mix-ups and reads and baits, all that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah. But yeah, um, tech-wise, not much more to him, I don't think. Yeah, yeah sure. Just on <laughs> Komo- like people like Komodo, what, what's been your experience playing against some of these Japanese like legends of Super Turbo? Like We, we were very interestedly watching your match from the... Um, there was some kind of like Daigo... Um, moment 37 kind of exhibition series or something we saw you played super turbo against daigo there like what's the experience of playing him or some of these other like just amazing japanese players that have played in the arcades for the last well, actually uh, on the daigo question could you explain um the background behind that because i remember talking to you about yeah I was, gonna, <laughs> I was gonna say i hate that video even though it's probably like the most viewed video of mine oh, really? that's a it's sick match losing well. horribly it was <laughs> sick but it. i was you in it yeah, but I was so mad because why well, I, I told I called, I told Quest this last week, but yeah, okay. basically that tournament, um, it was like a it was like a top eight on stage kind of situation. So we were playing, playing. And I think I lost to Mike Watson at that time. Yep. 
or like fourth place or fifth place or whatever. And as soon as I lost, I was like, okay, I lost. It kind of sucks. I wish I won, but it's all good. And then my buddy Afrikol was like sitting in the front row, and then you know him being Afrikol, if you know him, he's very happy and, and loving. He goes, "Hey, you finally lost. We can start drinking now." I'm like, sweet, <laughs> <laughs> we can start drinking, having fun for one. So, um, yeah, we were in the front row just watching the tournament play out, and we we're you know drinking beers or whatever. Yep. And then all of a sudden, you know, I think it was Mike Watson or Vi hops on the mic and says, "Okay, now we got a surprise exhibition to get back to Ara." <laughs> I'm like, "Are you serious?" <laughs> if I had known you're gonna bring out Daigo, I would have like taken this super seriously, like studied his like his uh, his videos and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So yeah, by the time I, I fought Doggo, I was already pretty pissed and like kind of three beers in. So I wasn't <laughs> completely drunk, but I was I was inebriated enough to be a little slower yeah. than usual. So I did okay, but I felt like man, I'm like playing in slow motion. I can't think right now. I just want to play yeah. and get it over with. I'm not gonna win yeah. in this condition. So you're saying on a you know given perfect conditions, you pretty much would have beaten him. That, that's it's a call out. Given perfect, I think I would have given him a much closer fight than what actually happened, which I'm pretty sure yeah. I got beat like 2-0, 3-0. But I think yeah, now I'm some, definitely competitive. There were some amazing rounds in there, though. Like, you, there was somewhere you had, like, full kind of control in the corner and, like, you know, large life weight, and then he gets the one knockdown. And it's like magic. He just walks forward, like, overhead sweep, walks forward, like, gets a throw. Like, there's some just the psychological strength that he has is amazing. Like, could... Could you feel that playing just for those few games, or was it just kind of a regular game? Uh, so definitely, I feel like the the power of Daigo is his ability to adapt to whatever you're doing, mm. and like recognize tendencies and punish you on those tendencies, even really small ones like like which ranges you're you're playing at, you know, how, how long do you block before you hit a button, stuff like that, like really small stuff in yeah. Super Turbo, which. I think it's one of the great strengths of the game in Super Turbo is that you're not given a lot of breaks during the actual round. You have to pay attention to everything because every single thing they do, or especially things they don't do, is super important. And I feel like guys like Valle and Daigo definitely have that have that ability. Mm-hmm. And so it's very impressive playing a player who's like that cerebral, who can pick up that much on your tendencies and adapt. I feel like Daigo's overall strength is definitely his ability to adapt. He's like, mm-hmm. you know... He has good mix-ups, good pressure, but ultimately it's his ability to suss out your strategy and like know how to counter it perfectly, almost intuitively. That makes him yeah. Daigo, essentially. How, so, yeah, intuitive, that's how, that... how, how intuitive do you think that is for someone like Vaya, maybe? It might be a bit hard with Daigo with the language barrier and stuff, but like, do you get the sense Vaya is consciously um, thinking about these tendencies that he's picking up, or is he more just kind of... Is, is it just something that happens intuitively, like, based on how many games he's played in the past and, like, what he's seen before? Well, I can't speak for Valle as far as other games, but I feel like in Super Turbo, you really don't have enough time to, like, stop and take a breather and pause and yeah. have an inner monologue with yourself. <laughs> no, like, I mean, that might be the... where you just walk around and, like, do floaty jumps and stuff for 10 seconds. Right, right. Like, Street Fighter 4, Street Fighter 5, there's definitely, like moments in the match where you can kind of take a breather reset figure out a strategy or like maybe you got caught in a combo and now you're sitting there eating getting hit by a, like a 10 string combo and then yeah. you have time to think but in st i really feel like it's it's a combination of his experiences in fighting games plus perhaps a bit of natural talent and he just like something in his intuition tells him okay i should do this now i don't know why but it, it feels right mm-hmm. and like afterwards if you talk to him he'll explain it to you but I think even he doesn't is not like fully conscious of it in the moment. It's sort of like a subconscious thing that comes out when you play. You just you just feel it. Yeah. And I think when you play fighting games for a while, you like you tap into that more and more the better you get as a player. Like there are certain decisions you don't really think about. You just feel in your heart, okay, this is the right thing to do. Even though it's risky, even though on paper it's stupid, you should go for it because it's definitely gonna work. And um, I take that to heart because one of Valle's greatest sayings is that at the highest level, there's always a little bit of randomness, a little bit of wild, aggressive activity, yeah, even at a high level. Like, uh, you know, everybody knows that people like to match reversal uppercut, right, when they're knocked yeah. down. And yeah. that scene is like a scrubby strategy. But then once you play better and better players, it like kind of circles back around to becoming a good strategy because yeah. now they think you'll never do it because it's so dumb. And then you pull it out. It's like, wow, that's stupid, but brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> So that's how come? Sad. How come? Whenever I get that feeling that like, oh, I just got to do this now, I always jump and get like uppercut in the face. <laughs> what? You gotta how, believe. Like, yeah. You gotta believe. I believe. I believe heart. in my jumps. I believe in every single time I jump exactly. forward. <laughs> St is about commitment. You have to commit to your dumb ideas. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, so that, the game will just let you fail. 
that's my problem. I'm not committing enough when I do dumb stuff. I just gotta really, really like go full brainless if I'm gonna go brainless. <laughs> that's the thing. Like, I feel like in Super Turbo, whatever you decide to do, whether it's smart, dumb, whatever, you have to commit to really doing it with your heart and soul. You know, so yeah. like win or lose, you at least played the way you wanted to play. Because then if you play, you're always scared, you're always like doubting yourself. Then like. That's not great for you as a player. It's not a great feeling to have. You're probably going to lose anyway, so you might as well just commit yourself to the moment. Yeah. Just do it. Yeah. Kind of linked to that, I got a quote from Anakin, obviously like a famous, um, you know, Japanese Super Turbo player, about someone Someone asked him in an interview, why Why does he think that Super Turbo has had so much longevity and popularity? And this is, his response was, I think it's because players with very little knowledge or techniques can have good matches with more skilled players. I believe players who have good interpersonal relationships and courage can have good matches. What's your reaction to that? Uh, to that quote? Yeah, that was a that was a very good quote. Um, I always enjoy listening to what the Japanese players have to say about Super Turbo because obviously they've been in the game for twenty plus years. Some of these guys, so they're gonna have a mm. different level of. I don't know, perspective than most guys playing Super Turbo. But I think he's he's spot on. Like, Super Turbo is a game where you can learn something really dumb and cheap in, like, five minutes and beat other players using that dumb technique that took very little skill to, mm -hmm. to learn. And then it'll take a lot more time to learn the defensive option to beat that. And then now you got to learn something else that's kind of different in you. And that's kind of how ST is built. It's, it's, it's building a foundation of... Cheap stuff, defensive counters to beat that cheap stuff, and over and over and over again. And yeah. So you have this kind of like body of knowledge and experience and, and ability that makes for a really exciting match. But I think he's spot on. Um, to like simplify it, I would go with what Vae says, mm -hmm. which is that ST is a is an easy game to learn, but super difficult to master. Yeah. I think is lends to very good uh, game design. Yeah, yeah, anyone can hop on and just like jump around, have fun, do dumb stuff. But like, if you really want to take the game seriously, you're rewarded with the amount of work you put in, the amount of study you put in, and mm -hmm. like, all the all the videos you watch, and uh, it creates a really great fighting game experience between you and your opponent at any level. Yeah. Well, one of the things that have helped the longevity of the game is all the re-releases we've seen. What is your opinion on the latest re-release, the um, 30th anniversary edition of Super Turbo? Honestly, I think as a, as a as a video game product, it's fantastic. For the money you pay and having access to all those games, it's it's amazing. It's a great way to like play fighting games. It's it comes with what 12 games, I believe. Yeah. yeah, you can have fun, you can mess around with your friends, you can play online, offline. It's it's a it's a great mode of accessibility for people who want to play all these old school games but don't want to you know, buy an old console or, you know, download an emulator on PC or whatever. So mm -hmm. in terms of the actual product, it's very, very good. I think the main issues with it is when it comes to, like, competitive play. Uh, the online is a bit lacking. The netcode is kind of inconsistent. Some people have great matchups, other people have bad matchups. But the other thing is, like, I know for ranked play, the speed is way too high on Super Turbo. It's super fast. So I really? think that turns a lot of people away. Yeah, it's way too fast. For is like that like play. some of the the like dip switches in the arcade or something are like set to the higher setting or like what is that? Is it just a poorly like ported version? Yeah. I've never heard that. Yeah, it's just lacking a few features. Like for ranked, they just set you can't change the speed on rank because it's ranked, right? You can't you can't yeah. change the rule set. So just the default speed they chose is super fast. Okay, it's right. fast. It's fast offline. It's super fast online where there's like lag introduced. Yeah. So that's that's one reason why I think ranked is is very poor in that game. Um, offline is fine. You can like change the settings, the speed settings to yeah, sure, yeah, for offline. It's great. And uh, yeah, um, I think the training mode mode is actually very good for basic things like learning basic combos and timings. Um, but there are some like training mode glitches in that game. I know Alpha especially has some some bad glitches oh, in really? there. That a lot of Alpha, yeah, Alpha three players were complaining about it. There, were, um, so before the game was actually released, some players had access to a beta version of 30 yeah. AC, and a lot of like Alpha three heads here in SoCal, and they were really focused on making sure that the uh, 30 AC was as close to arcade perfect as possible because oh, yeah. you know. As you guys know, like all these all these console versions always tout themselves as arcade perfect, and they never are. <laughs> yeah, and Alpha Three players are absolutely like insane about arcade perfectness. It's like a whole thing in the community. Exactly, and ST players are very much the same. Yeah, way, it's a so big I'm... debate at the moment in the community. Um, we've got a question from SPD for you. Yep. He says, "Ask L Trouble if he's willing to main another character in tournament." 
so the answer's pretty easy, actually. Yes, I am totally down to main a uh, different character. Um, so, no, I, I don't hate uh. myself that much. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, I can't play block at a beta very basic level. Um, but uh, the answer is, yeah, I'm totally open to learning new characters. Actually, um, it might not be a secret anymore, but like within SoCal and a few tournaments I've been to, I've been playing a lot of Dictator lately. Mm, okay. And I've been having so much fun with playing him and Ken too, but like more so Dictator. And so I've been having a blast because that character is, is super well designed. One of my top, you know, favorite fighting game characters of all time in any, in any fighting game. And uh, I love his gameplay, and I've been doing pretty well with him so far here. So I think down the line, it's very possible I might yeah. change to playing Dictator. Have you got your dizzy, re dizzy combos going? Oh, I do. Oh my god. You I have no idea how good <laughs> I felt laying that for the first time. I oh, felt like yeah. a god. Because you can't do that with Dalsam. You might land a stun and do like a like a, like a Yoga Inferno, that's it. But yeah. not so much fanciness. Um, but I feel like with Dalsam... Um, the design of Dalsam is such where, like, it's fun for me to play Dalsam, but for my opponent, it's probably very frustrating mm. and annoying. Whereas with Dictator, I feel like whatever match I play, we're both having fun, we're both, we both have agency, there's things we both can do, so, yeah. and so, like, winning feels so much better with Dictator than it ever does with Dalsam. Yeah, yeah, because, like, Dalsam, like, you can be, like, a really talented, like, a blocker or a geef player just because the matchup is so horrible. But I feel like with Dictator, he has so many bad matchups or, like, close to even matchups, a few good matchups that you really have to, like, earn every single win that you make. And it feels good, so. That's true, but with Dictator, I've seen him win a few tournaments before. I think it was a Torican tournament. Um, was it Arch Villain won it? And Riz yeah, Arsh- 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 yeah, Yeah, Arshad and, and Riz, uh, they're very good Dictator players, and, uh... I think playing Riz a lot has really like opened me up to the idea of playing him seriously as a as my new main character. But he's he's a really amazing character. I recommend everyone try Dictator. He's really fun. Well, speaking what? of uh, Riz One, you lost to him in the grand finals of the Spring Series LA qualifier. But you've um qualified for the, the up to ten thousand dollar tournament. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Unfortunately, with the coronavirus stuff going on, that event has been uh. indefinitely postponed. Um, so that's a big bummer for all of us because we were all looking forward to Spring Series because it's a it's an event where we can all get together across the U.S. and go to one tournament and have a lot of setups and play and meet and all that kind of stuff. But also there was several Japanese invites who were going there as well, some of whom have, haven't been to America ever or haven't gone in a long time. So I was looking forward to hanging out with those guys. But yeah, for now, the thanks to coronavirus, it's been postponed indefinitely. Yeah. How how many strong players are there in Japan who just never come out to America? Like we definitely see some of them in like the Evo Tournament of Legends and that kind of thing. Like, is it is there a really like deep scene there with like you know dozens of people that are on a similar level to these guys that we know about that just are kind of you know Japanese arcade only players? Yes, is <laughs> a yeah. short answer to that. Um, Japan truly feels like a magical place where like a lot of fighting game talent and hustle kind of exists there in multiple arcades and game centers yeah um it's weird because even when you go to japan yeah there's like a bunch of famous players some of whom travel and are really famous yeah um but there are many 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 good players there uh, a lot of whom like like no one even knows them like i like one time i went to hey and there was a really good dj player yeah and uh, he was beating everybody including the famous players and i asked yeah. one of the japanese guys like who is this guy and they're like i have no idea who he is he just shows up <laughs> and plays like after work and he never ever goes to tournaments and he doesn't talk yeah. to anybody he's just like a die hard like That's stereotypical amazing. salaryman who yeah. just shows up to the arcade every day after work in like the traditional salary man, you know, yep. dress shirt and suit and just play and just that's win sick. and then just go home. And they never join tournaments because they don't care. They just want to play video games. Yeah. And that's a very common experience across Japan. So, yeah, there's there's killers everywhere we don't know about who are very good across multiple games. Are there any um, Japanese Dalsim players in particular that you learn from? Um, so learning the game, I didn't really have like a, like a mentor or a tutor here who specifically played Dalsum. So I always joke that my mentor is YouTube. <laughs> yeah. I would just YouTube like, uh, pretty much any Dalsum I could find that was playing at a pretty high level, which included everyone from, um, Afro Cole and Alex Wolf here in the U S John Rambo to, mm-hmm. uh, Japanese players like, uh, Jayan, Hakase, KKY, Shin, um, all those kind of guys, Yoshimura. Um, so I feel like uh, my experience as Dalsum, you know, learning the character is a combination of many different Dalsums that I've seen online. 
and um, usually like I study their their matchups and I go okay I'm gonna try that counter or that strategy see how I like it see if it's consistent and I go and test it out in like practice or in tournaments usually is where I do the most quote unquote practice yeah. and then yeah I I have that like Bruce Lee philosophy of like if it works keep it if not just discard it and find something wow. else and so I've kind of I'm I'm very proud to have built my own play style with Dalsum that I haven't copied you know, any other player perfectly. But yep. I think um, uh, the first time I fought Matson, I think I made, like, a good impression on him because I talked to him afterward. It felt like, you know, fighting you, it felt like I was fighting Jayon. Like, yeah. You're not, as, you're not as good at him, obviously, but, like, you know, same color. And so yeah. I think kind of on accident, I sort of, like, my play style matches closest with Jayon. Yeah, okay. So me and Jayon have a pretty good relationship. He's, he's my homie. He's my, he's, my, he's my older brother. Yeah, nice. Yeah, so I think, yeah, if any playstyle I, I kind of some, somewhat emulate inten- unintentionally, <laughs> it'd be Giants, but... Yep. Some of the older Wednesday night fight vids, I saw something called Trollcoin. Who introduced it, and what was the purpose of it? So Trollcoin was started by my good friend Sergev over at Arcadium. Uh, he runs a... He, he, he runs a stream on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Arcadium. And he plays a bunch of different games, but typically on Monday night, he does like an online fight key tournament for Super Turbo. Mm-hmm. And so besides being a streamer and a Super Turbo guy, he actually is really involved with uh, cryptocurrency. And so he made <laughs> really? up, he made his own called Trollcoin, <laughs> just for fun, essentially. But then in the last few years, I think he's like taking it really seriously. And he's been like trying to like hand out free troll coin to people to get them interested in troll coin. And uh, yeah, so he's passed out quite a bit of troll coin just for fun and to get people interested in cryptocurrencies. So he gave a bunch to me like way back in the day just for fun. And like maybe I, I like won a tournament, an online tournament. And he gave it to me. But mm-hmm. the last time I checked, like I checked my account balance and it was like 450 US dollars worth of troll coin, <laughs> which is wow. insane. Well, to, real, you, you can so get really, the real cash. Yes, I can cash that in and turn it to real currency. Wow. So I was like, wow, how did this like grow in value on accident? I didn't even pay attention to it. Is this an investment advice? Like, what would, would you advise people to like, you know, maybe they're saving up a bit of money because of the coronavirus situation? Like, would you advise them to invest that in troll coin? Hey, if they're interested in cryptocurrency, it can't hurt to like spread your portfolio out, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, uh, you know, Bitcoin at this point is pretty expensive to get to invest in, but yeah, for sure. It's like Dogecoin and Troll Coins. If you're into that, I, I'd, I'd ask Sarah Game of Arcadium. I'm not the expert. I just got handed a bunch of money and somehow it yeah. grew. <laughs> I, I could be accidentally laundering money. I have no <laughs> idea what's yeah, going on. <laughs> I know like, I'm involved in some sort of illegal conspiracy I didn't know about, yeah. but yeah, ask us here again at Arcadia if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Yeah, what what do you think about mob and organized crime involvement in the FJC? Uh, I mean, you know, these guys, these kind of guys like that are always looking for avenues to uh, clean their money, so to speak. So oh, yeah, for sure. I'm, if any FBI, SCI are listening, I'm not personally involved with that kind of stuff. <laughs> I hold myself unaccountable for <laughs> the yeah. actions of my co-conspirators. Um, okay. But, right. I mean, it's going to happen. You know, people are going to find ways to turn dirty money to clean money through any <laughs> avenue they can find. So, like, I have no comment on that. It happens. <laughs> wow. Wow. That was interesting. Um, yeah, so just uh, on, on Sergei. Uh, Sir Chief. Yeah, I was going to ask this. You go, you go. Um, was he actually putting on, like, a fake accent or was he yeah. like, a natural accent at the time? Ooh, well, I can't reveal trade secrets. You guys ask him about that. <laughs> We've done, deep, we've done deep analysis of multiple YouTube videos on this. We've, we've gone deep into the internet. We, we want to hear it from the source. Is is the accent in the tutorial videos fake? Man, I, trade secrets, man. If you want the, if you want the truth, you got to talk to him. I can't, you know. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. We will. <laughs> we will talk to him. <laughs> Good. I hope you guys do. It'll be a fun conversation. <laughs> uh, when you were making those tutorial vids, did you expect them to get the reception they got? Because it seemed to be mostly positive. You put a lot of people into there. Were you expecting that sort of result? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, basically, when I started making those tutorials, it was mostly because I felt like there was a lack of Super Turbo content available, just in general, but especially on YouTube. And I think that's still true to this day. Even though there is slightly more content than there used to be, I think there's still a need for more content because Super Turbo is such a weird, strange game that I think it needs a little more explanation. Um, but at the time, there wasn't much out there, and I was really inspired by tutorials made by David Serlin for HDR, and uh, Damned I made a few tutorials called Super Turbo Saturdays that were really good. But I feel like there was absolutely nothing there for, like, beginner-level players who, like, you know, 
maybe they have some experience in fighting games, but none in Super Turbo, or maybe they have like no experience in fighting games at all and are starting with Super Turbo. So I made those tutorials aimed at that level of player because there wasn't anything out there. And so, I mean, you guys have seen the videos. They're very rough, completely unedited. Uh, we literally just like streamed those tutorials over at twitch.tv slash Arcadium way back in the day. Yeah. And then we just do like a mass export to YouTube. And that's it. There wasn't much editing. So that's why they're so long. We go on so many tangents because it's really hard to keep my guests and sure keep under control on sometimes. Yeah. And so, yeah, I make the joke that like, I yell at them all the time. They're like, can we please talk about Super Turbo? I know you guys want to talk about like random stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, I saw one where, he, where he's in the background and he's dressing up as E-Honda. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's so much going on. Like, I just want to talk about Super Turbo, and these guys want to go off on various tangents. It's yeah, fun, well, but I don't think it makes—I don't think it makes for a very clean video. So. Yeah, I remember the um the what was it called DJ video. It was Muffin yeah. Man, and there was Sergey, and they were kind of just joking at each other and making fun of each other. That was an yeah. entertaining vid. <laughs> Yeah, because that's what we do. Like that's that's just how we are, like normally. So when we turn the cameras on, they're not aware that I'm trying to make some content here. So we went off on a lot of tangents, but the content's really good. If you have the time to sit there and like sift yeah. through the BS, there's yeah. some really good content in there. It's just it's just not clean edited. For it. No, I definitely learned a lot from those, and I can tell you a lot of people did. Very thankfully, did those those videos. Where are those yeah. films? It look are they in some kind of arcade, or is that Sergio's house? So like, where is that? It's a weird so looking is, space. So that is a uh, Sergey's uh, studio uh, located oh, wow. in his house. He actually has like a like a garage that he completely converted into like a streaming gaming lounge man cave type <laughs> situation. It's sick. really cool. Actually. No, like he has like he has like a, a whole shelf full of like old school consoles. Yeah. And whenever you want, you just pull off a SNES, a Sega Saturn, whatever you want, wow. just play there. It's that troll coin money. It really is, man. All that all that mob money is coming through pretty yeah. good. There. I, I guess um the reason you stopped doing it would be because you didn't have the time to do it or something like that. But um when it came to tutorials, why didn't you make a Dalesome vid given that you mm. you main him? He's the character you know best. I know. So so the originally the plan was to do the entire cast of characters, all sixteen um yep. characters and like, you know, call it a day, finish it there. If people wanted more like in-depth, intermediate, advanced level content, I would post it out. But basically, after a while, I like because the theme of the tutorial is that I would try to have as many guests as possible. Because at that time, especially, I wasn't like a proficient uh, like master of any of those characters. So yeah. I would try to bring on other people. That way, it kind of keeps the show different, fun. You'd have more credibility with like actual character loyalists showing off their character but after a while it got really hard to like get a lot of these guys to come out and so we just kind of lost gas on it and then school and work and stuff like that took over so we just never got around to finishing it and the reason why there's no dalsam tutorial because i specifically wanted to do him last because um even to ex to begin to explain that character at a beginning level would take me like 10 hours broken up yeah. into different chapters and episodes <laughs> it's a mini series <laughs> you know it really would have to be because he has like a million normals he's got a lot of anti-airs yeah. i think one time i counted how many anti-airs i used in total with dalsam and it ended up, it ended up being like nine to twelve anti-airs like <laughs> yeah like no guy. joke like yeah like i could use a lot and that wasn't even including like the weird ones you can do if you really want to feel yourself yeah. <laughs> um so yeah like just to even explain like how to use his normals it would take over an hour easily rapidly going through without any tangents, which as you yeah. said is impossible over at yeah. the Arcadium studio. So yeah, I left him for last. And uh, now, yeah, I've got a lot of positive responses. So I'm trying to figure out if I can do it somehow from home and just like put it out there just so people have yeah. something to, to digest. But yeah, I'm trying to figure it out. Yeah. Going back to the um, free play tournament, if it came back on, you know, in post Corona, would you enter the championship edition or hyper fighting tournaments? Absolutely, man. I love those games. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Street Fighter too, even like the original versions. And uh, even though I'm I'm like mostly known for Super Turbo, honestly, like if you can play Super Turbo, you're probably pretty decent at like Champion Edition and Hyper Fighter. Yeah. You might not be the super diehard guys who like play those games as their main tournament, but you'll do well. Yeah, exactly. One of the Brazilians. Um, 
But yeah, there's still a competitive scene for both Champion Edition and Hyper Fighter. So yeah, I would I was definitely planning on joining both those tournaments along with Super Turbo. I wasn't gonna join the Street Fighter the movie game tournament. <laughs> that, that game is Street so Fighter, awful. The movie, the game. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, it's already a game. Why is there a, a movie version of the game? <laughs> um, yeah, that game is horrible. I would not touch it in a million years. Uh, who would you main in the, the Championship Edition and Hyper Fighting games? Uh, you know, even though I'm known for Dalsum, I like playing other characters. So actually, in Champion and Hyper Fighting, I like playing Sagan. He's he's really oh, fun really? in those games. Yeah, yeah, he's really fun. One of those and games. like, yeah, but like also because like um, Dalsum and those older versions have like different uh, attacks. You know, like how yeah. to do his drills are very different. He has no close normals, et cetera, et cetera. So, like, for me, I didn't want to, like, mess up my Super Turbo Dalsum yeah, muscle yeah. memory. Because it already sucks as it is. If I try to, like, play different versions of Dalsum, I'm going to be completely screwing myself over. Yeah. And, like, so I, I have a difficulty playing the same main character across different games. So I tend to play different characters for, like, original Street Fighter 2, Alpha Series, CVS 2. I play different characters and all. Yeah, I can say that. So this, this podcast is mainly about the Alpha Series and, like, there was a bit of a scene kind of getting going in Australia for Alpha 3. Um, right. I mean, some big online tournaments and some in-person tournaments as well. Like, what's your experience with the Alpha series? Like, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, like, what characters do you play? All, all that kind of stuff. Uh, sure. So, um, for starters, I'll preface this by saying I'm not, like, a very strong Alpha player at all. <laughs> so, if I say anything, like, technically wrong about Alpha, yeah, or whatever, so. mechanics or whatever, I apologize. I don't mean to, you know, spread out misinformation. Yep. Obviously, yeah. I don't know about that much about the game. Um, but for me, I really like Alpha 2 and Alpha 3. Um, mm -hmm. I know a lot of guys are divisive about that. Some, like, love Alpha 2, hate Alpha 3. Some love Alpha 3, hate Alpha 2. Yep. Um, I like both games, and I feel like... Uh, Alpha to me was like the ultimate expression of Capcom being really experimental. Mm, uh, yeah, that's a know, great point. For better or for worse, they uh, I think they saw the success that they were having with the Versus series, you know, the mm -hmm. X Men Street Fighter Marvel series games, and they wanted to put that in the Street Fighter because I, I feel like I don't know if it's true, but I feel like they wanted to change the gameplay from how it was in Street Fighter Two, which is very slow and tactical and uh you know very precise heavy focus on zoning and fireballs yeah into alpha two and three where it was more about movement speed footsies you know allowing characters to jump in with like not too much of a threat yeah and uh, more importantly custom combos which if you think about it is an insane idea to put custom combos in a fighting game but at the time i felt like they were just trying to put anything they can in a fighting game and see what sticks Mm -hmm. So yep. I felt like they, they they did that with Alpha 1, which is a horrible game, but you could tell it was like a prototype of what eventually became Alpha 2. Yeah. And then Alpha 2 was amazing. There were some issues. And then Alpha 3 was really where they put all the zany, crazy stuff in a fighting game. Oh, it, yeah. hasn't been that, it hasn't been that crazy since. And uh, I know Alpha 3, some people shit on because it's like, it's there's a lot of cheap stuff in it, but that also makes it very great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And enjoyable and fun is trying to figure out ways to do the cheap stuff or counter it, and it makes for a very engaging neutral game. So I absolutely adore the footies game, especially in Alpha 3. Would you play it? Would you play it in a tournament? Like, what, um, why do you think it hasn't had the, like, either Alpha 2 or Alpha 3 has had the kind of um, popularity, like, lasting popularity compared to Super Turbo? Um, so I think part of it was um, Alpha 2 is a much bigger game over in the East Coast. And mm -hmm. so I think there's a there's a stronger community over in the East Coast and the Midwest for Alpha 2. And that was just yeah, right. happens, happens to be the game of choice that they made. And so through their efforts, they used to run a lot of like consistent tournaments. Uh, the two, two old series over in New York being a pretty notable example. Um, I think they had really helped to market the game, put it on stream. Uh, modernizer for this new fighting game generation who perhaps haven't seen Alpha 2 or 3 or haven't yeah. played it and uh, showcase it that way. So I think part of it was that just Alpha 2 just uh, made a lasting impact over in the East Coast where they started to put more work into it. And also I think Alpha 3, I don't know, I feel like some people think it's really hard to get into because there there is a lot of custom combos basically you have to learn and yeah. perfect and master in the game and uh yeah it's, it's it's stuff like that also it's a very fast game so if you're coming from like uh like a third strike or even cvs2 street fighter 4 alpha 3 is super fast i think for some yeah, people oh, it's yeah. a very intimidating facet of the game mm -hmm. but no i think it's a great game i think it should it deserves more love than it has right now to be honest I, i'm really happy to hear that you guys are doing your thing with alpha 3 and growing the community there yeah cool just, just on that aspect of growing the community, like, I think you're definitely a kind of, um, 
leading figure in Super Turbo in terms of the community and like the whole ST revival stuff. Like, was that something that you were doing really intentionally, trying to help new players and grow the community, or, or was that something that just kind of came with your um, love of the game? Or yeah, how did you kind of get started with that? It's kind of a mix of all three. Um, I think in the beginning, I was definitely just sort of like a normal fan slash player. Mm-hmm. And I would play the games, and but it it would be more like a like a self centered focus, like oh like I need to improve so I can start winning, and and winning is fun, and it's fun beating other people, which it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think after a while, I started to appreciate more the fact that you know, winning is only fun if there's a lot of healthy competition to to challenge you. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Like, there's no fun being top dog and like you beat everyone. It's just not fun. It's not enjoyable. Even though you're winning, it's just not. I don't know. It's just. Yeah, it kind of it kind of dulls the experience a little bit. So I think you have, early no, on, you have no challenge to look forward to. Just people that want to beat you. Yeah, and like for me, Super Turbo eventually evolved to like became a thing where I I would like be able to meet new people through Super Turbo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So besides playing the game, it was just really fun meeting new members of the community, uh, both newcomers to the scene as well as players from other scenes. Like, did you meet did you meet your wife through Super Turbo? Is that correct? No. No, 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 actually, I met right. I met my current fiance well before Super Turbo. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's funny because she actually used to hate fighting games and really did not understand fighting. Games. <laughs> and then she met you. You, you can and hear her laughing in the background, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking yeah. shit, Tanya. What? Say something, huh? <laughs> it's, it's my podcast. Ah, uh, special guest. Special guest. <laughs> surprise! <laughs> a new challenger has appeared. <laughs> Yeah. Like a kuma at the end of Super Turbo. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, so I won't I won't harp on it too much. But yeah, basically in the beginning, uh, she played like video games and stuff like that, but she didn't have much experience in fighting games. And so whenever we would like play fighting games, whatever, and like not hang out with her, she would get like kind of upset. Like, why are you guys playing this game? Like, it's a dumb, yep. matching game. Like, why is it fun? And so basically, being the intelligent Dolls and player I am, I kind of, I kind of, don't deny it, Tony, don't deny it. Um, anyways, I kind of, like, got her through, into fighting games. Yeah. Not through the game itself, but through, like, uh, do you guys remember Cross Counter TV with Mike Cross and Gutex? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Before? I love that. Yeah, yeah. I got her introduced on that, like, those, like, YouTube shows. Yep. So I wasn't selling her on the game. I was selling her on the personalities, the kind of people that are mm-hmm. playing the game. The storylines that were coming out that were very amazing. And so she really got into that kind of social aspect yeah. of Street Fighter 4. And then after that, she wanted to try out the game. And so she would try the game. And then I would kind of teach her the, the fundamentals. Like, okay, like, these are your anti-airs. Anti-airs are very important so that people don't just jump all over you. Yeah. And then, yeah. Wow, so it was, a long, it was a plan. It was like a fully thought out um, game plan. Boys, boys, everything I do is calculated. You know, dolls <laughs> and players, you know, we're always playing calculus and 4D chess, yeah. 200 IQ kind of stuff. Even in here. life. Do you think your, do you think your well, dolls and players th- impacted your life? Uh, yeah, I think so. It was funny because um, I was having like a random gaming conversation with my fiance, as we do. Yeah. And like, we're, we were talking about like, okay, what kind of Ninja Turtle did you used to play on that old uh, arcade game where it yeah. was, you know, Ninja Turtles, it was a four player co-op game. And I was like, oh, I played Donatello because I really like his, his range. And she was like, <laughs> oh my god, all the characters you play have long range attacks. I'm like, holy shit. And like, wow. I had like a gaming flashback where like, I look back on the history of me as video <laughs> games. I'm like, I played Donatello who has the longest range. I like FPS games. I like playing sniper rifles. I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> everything I do involves long range attack and calculation. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so wow. That's how we got into that. But anyways, yeah, she learned Street Fighter, learned to love Street Fighter, got more into Super Turbo. Cause I, I told her if you learn Super Turbo, it'll improve your fundamentals. Mm. And so she got into ST, fell in love with the community, fell in love with the game. Here we are later. Oh, and so, yeah, I fell in love with me, I guess. I hope. <laughs> Maybe not now, though. I'm trying to talk to trash, but it's worth it. It was a good joke. I thought it was worth it, so. Yeah, yeah. Last week, I was um, talking to you about that tournament where you beat Ballet, and then yeah. afterwards, she proposed to you, and then you proposed to her. Yeah. Um, you were saying that a lot of people, like, um, ask you about that, and all. why do you think all these gaming guys are asking you? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's funny, <laughs> but also, like, kind of endearing because um 
me and Tanya realized, like, you know, even though it was really cool that we got proposed and it happened at a tournament, on stream, all that kind of stuff, um, I think we both agree that one of the best things to come out of that, besides us getting engaged, was, like, all the positive feedback we got from the community at large. Even from, like, people that didn't know us, like, strangers would come up to us and say, hey, congratulations, I'm really happy for you, too. I'm like, cool, awesome, man, thank you. And then the guy would walk away and Tanya would be like, do you know that guy? I'm like, <laughs> never met that guy in my life but yeah i think it produced it was like a moment of like joy and unbridled happiness that kind of affected everybody so i think it was a good moment for people to, to i don't know just have a little positivity in their life kind of thing you know were you waiting to like win a tournament before you proposed or was it like planned for okay. that okay so I know I'm long-winded, but I'll keep this short. No, no, so basically, <laughs> yeah, I want I want to talk to you guys too. I don't want to just sit here on my soapbox and just talk. No, no, no. <laughs> You're the star. You're the star of the show. Oh man, I like <laughs> talking with people. I hate I hate talking about myself. Um, basically, uh, Tanya had wanted to like propose to me for a long time. I don't know what it was. She just had it in her head. Hey, I should propose to this guy. Before cool so she had it completely planned out where like she told a bunch of people hey don't tell eugene but i'm planning to propose to him at combo yeah. breaker win or lose whatever i'm gonna propose to him <laughs> and so she got like she had everything ready like she had a ring for me she had a dress she like planned out with her group of like fgc girls to like help her do her hair and makeup the day of yeah blah 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 so that caught me off guard and like i had absolutely no idea that she planned this until the, the, the finals day of the tournament when she showed up in like a dress and like makeup, which, which if you know Tanya is like completely <laughs> not her thing. Yeah. Like yeah. she usually wears like jeans, like an FGC shirt, whatever, no makeup, not a big deal. Yeah. So I thought it was suspicious. But anyway, so you um, had the raid. You had the raid basically. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was very odd experience. Uh, so I thought something was up. Uh, but she didn't know that like I had I, I I had already had an engagement ring for like the past I don't know three months before Combo Breaker, oh, so I yeah. was planning to like post her too, but I didn't plan it nearly as well as she did. So I was like, okay, I'll bring this ring. I'm like, you know, if the if the feeling's right, I'll propose to her. And wow. like my my only thing was like I want to propose to her not around California because we're here all the time. I want something special, so like I would want to propose to her. But we're traveling to a tournament or traveling for fun or going to Japan or something like that. So I brought it just in case, but I didn't really, you know, think it was going to happen that day. Okay, yeah. So yeah, so yeah, she she totally caught me off guard when she started proposing to me after I won the tournament. And then she did her spiel. I was like, I was like, I was kind of shocked. Like, oh my God, like we both had the same idea to like propose to each other in yeah. the same time frame. And then she didn't know that I had the ring on me too, so like I busted that out. That was kind of like <laughs> that, that was kind of like, <laughs> it was funny because like the best thing I heard about that was like online because they were streaming the entire time like the Super <laughs> Turbo tournament. Yeah, this haunt. Yeah, exactly. Like, Tanya told them, so they kept the camera on us. And the best comment was like, oh my god, she didn't know he had a one-frame reversal proposal window. <laughs> that is, that's beautiful, man. That, that is one of the best proposal stories I've ever heard. I've never heard of that. The double, the, um, yeah, the double. Yeah, man, the double KO or double perfect. Or yeah, double KO. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was really cool, so I'm glad people enjoyed that moment. That, that yeah. brought us a lot of happiness, too. Yeah. Um, Flycade, I've seen you commentate with Arcadium on his stream before about it, like, um, you know, Monday Night Fights. How come you um, have never entered them before? Do you not like playing online or there's something there? So I've played them a few times, but unfortunately I'm spoiled here in SoCal to have a lot of access to uh, super guns and arcade cabin and all that kind of stuff. So for me, I'd much rather play Super Turbo offline or in but, person. But now you, now you can't, so could we see you playing mm, online? Yeah. Yeah, I know. So like now I can't. So I'm I'm like really jonesing to play online. So I'm thinking about joining one of these online tournaments. But I mean, in the meantime, I'm playing Doom. I'm playing Counter Strike. I've got I've got other yeah. online games that I play. You get options. So yeah, I'm thinking about joining these online tournaments just to you know make sure I'm still kind of warm. But at the same time, I'm here with like two super guns right next to me. So I'm like, <laughs> whenever I want to play Super Turbo, I'll just pull out the super gun and play with Tanya and do that. So. Yeah, I'm very uh, fortunate in this quarantine to have access to Super Turbo still. Yeah. So yeah, I'll, I'll I'll think about it, but man, I really like playing offline. Not just because like it's not ideal in terms of speed and timing and online lag, but like one of the biggest reasons that I like playing offline was that I like I like interacting with people offline. You know, so I you love talking shit. If you haven't yeah. noticed, like yeah, even with Tanya next to me, I like I like talking a lot of trash. Do, so do you talk trash in the game, in tournaments? Like, do you talk trash in serious games? 
Oh, never in tournament. For okay. me, tournaments are like... You should do it. Bring, start, start it up. Oh, like, Michael shit. Jordan talks trash, you know, in the NBA Finals. So, like, I, I could see that being a niche for you. Yeah, that'd be that'd be quite the heel turn, you know, turn to the heel of the FG, of the Super Turbo community. Like, oh my God, he was so nice in the tour. Now he's a complete asshole. What the hell is going yeah. on? Um, no, but like for me, I always feel like in tournament, no matter who wins or loses, the fact that you're there at a tournament, I I will show you respect, afford it to you. Mm. Maybe we can have a tutorial on trash talking. Oh yeah. my god, you have no idea. You have no idea the psychological warfare I get into if I talk oh, yeah. a lot of stuff. It's got me in trouble with Tanya quite a few times. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, in tournament, I keep it very serious. I, I, I always feel like ST is already a very hard game to play. And it's even more of a commitment if you like choose to like travel to a tournament. So like, no matter if I win or lose, I always shake your hand. I always give you respect. You know, whatever. We could talk yeah. trash and casuals. Casuals is casuals for fun. But in tournament, yeah. I always take it very, very seriously, and I always do my best. And so. is there um, a player that stands out in particular that you find that it's fun to play them, like more so than others? Hmm. I really enjoy fighting uh, Kusumondo mm, and yeah. Matsun. Um, just their overall play styles is very, very aggressive and a little wild, but it works because they have the experience and the knowledge and the execution to make, uh, you know, quote unquote aggressive, dumb gameplay work very, very well. And I think it's very, uh, that's like in like, in like stark contrast to my, my own style. Like, I feel like me and Damdai both come from the same school of lane. Like we like breaking the game down to basic flow charts, having like an optimal play for any situation and committing yeah. to that play. But the more I play against high level players, the more I feel like there is no grand flow chart. You have to play in the moment and just and just do what feels right, even if it's dumb. Because if you play too flow chart and too like linear and technical, you become very easy to read. And I feel like at the high level, Japanese players who are truly good and talented, guys like Matsu, Kusumondo, they'll find ways to exploit it and punish it. Even though it was like a smart, safe decision, they will they will punish it. So you have to like have a little flex in Super Turbo, which is why I feel like if you watch high level like Japanese footage, they're often doing like wild, crazy stuff because it's the only way that like works at that level. Yeah, it's wrapped around again. Yeah, exactly. Like like I said before, like Bai said, at the highest levels of plays, there's always a little bit of randomness because you can't play too clean or technical because then you become obvious and easy to read and good players know how to punish that, even though it seems like mm -hmm. it should be punished. So yeah, yeah. So definitely Kusumondo Matsu.